chapter 1, verses 1 to 20. Now, of course, he's going to read it for us in Ukrainian, uh, which would be lovely. Um, but you can follow along either on the screen behind in English or in your own Bibles. So please do that. Andre. Євангелія від Марка Початок Євангелії Ісуса Христа, Сина Божого Як у пророка Ісаї написано Ось перед обличчя Твоє посилаю свого посланця, який перед Тобою дорогу Твою приготує Голос того, хто кличе у пустині Готуйте дорогу для Господа, рівняйте стежки йому Виступив був так Іван, що в пустині хрестив, та проповідував хрещення на покаяння для прощення гріхів. І до нього приходила вся країна юдейська, і всі єрусалимляни, і в річці Йордані від його хрестились, вони і визнавали гріхи свої. А Іван зодягався в одежу з верблюжого волосу, і мав пояс ремінний на стегнах своїх, а їв сарану та мед польовий. І він проповідував, кажучи, у слід за мною йде он потужніший від мене, що йому я не гідний, нагнувшись розв'язувати ремінці від взуття його. Я хрестив вас водою, а той вас хреститиме Духом Святим. І сталося тими днями, Прийшов Ісус з Назарету Галілейського, і від Івана хрестився в Йордані. І зараз, коли він виходив із води, то побачив Іван небо розкрите, і духа, як голуба, що сходив на нього. І голос із неба почувся, «Ти син мій улюблений, що я вподобав його». І зараз повів його дух в пустиню. І він був сорок днів у пустині, випробовуваний від сатани, і перебував зі звіриною, і служили йому ангели. А коли Іван виданий був, то прийшов Ісус до Галілеї і проповідував Божу Євангелію. І говорив, збулися часи, і Боже царство, царство наблизилось. Покайтеся і віруйте в Євангелію. А коли він проходив біля Галилейського моря, то побачив Симона та Андрія, брата Симонового, що невода в море закидали, бо рибалками були. І сказав їм Ісус, ідіть у слід за мною, і зроблю, що станете виловцями людей. І зараз вони свого Невода покинули та й пішли вслід за ним. А коли недалеко пройшов, то побачив він Якова, Заведеєвого, та брата його Івана, то й вони в човні невода лагодили. І зараз покликав він їх, і вони залишили батька свого Заведея в човні з робітниками і пішли вслід за ним. Амінь. Barbara. <laughs> we don't expect you to preach in Ukrainian, right? Are you sure? Okay, that's really. But that was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for Barbara for the ministry that she's had with us for many years. And once again, this morning, we ask for an empowering for her, that you might speak through her the words that you want to speak for us. Lord, so that we would be encouraged, challenged, and deepened in our understanding of how we can serve you and walk with you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I 
I started reading um, Mark's Gospel in the week and thought, you know, it's straightforward. I'll read it all in one go, which is quite a nice exercise every now and again. But by the time I got halfway through, I have to tell you, I was absolutely breathless because Mark's Gospel moves at such a pace. It was indeed the first Gospel, we're told, that was written. And it just picks up and goes on and, of course, must have been an incredible thing for the early um, people that were trying to talk about the gospel to have some kind of continuity as to the life of Jesus. Mark was an associate of Peter, and therefore much of the um, stuff that we get in Mark's gospel is Peter's reminiscences, but also because Mark was on the edge of the crowd that always was around Jesus, then his memories too. It's action-packed, it moves at a pace. It starts with that um, prophecy that talks about John making the way for Jesus. It moves on to the baptism of Jesus very quickly, to Jesus going into the wilderness and being tempted by Satan. And we then start, if you like, we can see the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. It moves on quickly to say that the first thing that he does is to gather together um, the disciples, the people that will follow him, the people that he will teach, the people who will see and understand to some degree who he is and what he is about. Mark really describes Jesus as the servant of God, a servant ministry. And as he calls his disciples, then we see, first of all, in verse 16 of chapter 1, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and they followed him. And again, when he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Extraordinary number of people that are following him. And we go on into um, Mark 3, and we have a list of the apostles there. And sometimes we forget who they were. Jesus went on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, he named them, which means the sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And so it is accomplished. He has his group of 12. There were others, lots of others around him. There were those women who supported him financially, gave him hospitality. They were there, but he has the 12. And I'm wondering, what were their expectations? What, what was in their minds when they suddenly left everything and followed? What was it about Jesus that drew them to him? Made them just get up and leave and go. He went on to call um, Levi, of course, the, the, the tax collector. That did not go down well with anybody, I imagine. But that's the people that he's gathering to him. I don't know what their expectations were. I don't know what his expectations were of them, except he knew that they were the group of people. They're going to be the ones that will continue his ministry when he has died and risen and fulfilled the promise of the Holy Spirit. But it's about what their expectations were and moves on to what their experience was. Think about what they saw and what they heard, what they experienced. The healings, deliverance from demons, miracles of feeding people, 
walking and talking with Jesus, eating with him, experiencing all of his life with him for those um, short, that short time, those couple of years or so, those three years. And they were with him. They saw it. They were not like the rest of us. They were not exactly a perfect group. They had their moments, let's face it. Did he know that Peter would deny him? Right at this stage, probably not. But he did. And Mark, his friend, puts it in. But here we know, as we even read the name Judas Iscariot, we know what that outcome will be. So what did they expect? What did they experience? And how did they move on? We know that at the end they were a troubled group, but they held together and waited in that room at Pentecost for the power of the Holy Spirit to come. Over the past weeks, Steve has been talking to us about the kind of things that many Christians, many non-Christians will come and ask those of us who are Christians. They will ask those questions, some out of real concern, out of real interest, but beware. There are always those who will try and catch us out. Deal gently with such people, okay? So it's important that we know how to tell, to speak out what we believe and the things that, that, that are important, not just to us, but to the world at large. I think that's part of the Lord's expectation of us who know and love him. But also, I think that, and I, I know I go on about this, but there's something so powerful about telling our stories. Some of them will be fantastic, and others will be actually, do you know what, just a tad ordinary, but no more miracul less miraculous for that. I remember around here a very, very long time ago, there was some kind, I can't even remember what it was called, of drive to knock on doors, to invite people to meetings, and there was all sorts of churches that came together. I think it was predominantly Anglican, I can't remember. But I remember one of the speakers in a crowded hall saying that one of the things that he um, had done was to knock on doors to invite people in with a piece of paper inviting them to a meeting. And knowing that sometimes you get a good reception and sometimes you don't. But at one particular door, he realized as the woman opened the door that she looked at him with interest as he explained who he was and what he was doing, and she invited him in for a cup of tea, as you do. And he went in, and they talked, and they talked, and she came to that point of saying, it's for me. And so he led her in that lovely moment of commitment in a prayer of commitment to Jesus. He left the house, euphoric, can you imagine that? Our coming to faith is one thing. The excitement of seeing other people come to faith is just exhilarating. And as he walked out at the front door, a next door neighbor was in the garden and she stopped him and said, have you had a good time? And he said, yes, and he, she said, I've lived next door to her for 20 years. We've been friends for 20 years. I've prayed for her for 20 years. Sometimes we don't know who it is that's involved in that moment when we say, do you know, this is for me. We know that God has gone before, and he will touch your heart in new ways. Me? My story? Well, it has to do with a praying grandmother for a start off. So I've tried to be the praying grandmother. Not just to my own grandchildren, but to children that I know and see in the village, around me, friends' children. It was also my mother who, when I was five years old, started working with a group of Christian women who invited her to the local Methodist church. And so from that day on, she came to faith, and therefore, I went to church, Sunday school and so on, every Sunday. And then the moment came when we too had some kind of outreach thing going on, 
And I remember, I remember it so well, that all the congregation of this Methodist church on Freezy Estate, where they were all there, and they were glowing because they just knew this was going to be a powerful moment. And it was, for several of us, including me. I could not have stayed in my seat if I tried. And I'm grateful for a student from the local theological college called Arnold Clough. I don't know what happened to Arnold Clough, but he was the guy who was preaching the day that I thought, do you know what? I'm for Jesus and Jesus is for me. I don't know what my expectations were at that particular moment. There is no way that I could have known what the experiences that I would have because of him in my life, of how if we open up to him, he does the most extraordinary things. I've been to the most incredible places just with a Bible and just been asked to go and to speak. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the teenager who had a terrible stammer, dreadful stammer. I spluttered my way through um, school most of the time. And yet somewhere along the line, I know that the Lord healed me and said, I think you need to do this. As it happens, other people around me in the church that I was going to, they too um, felt that this was something that I should be doing. I praise God for people who see other people in new and different ways. We need to be aware of that. There are people in our midst who have gifts that the Lord wants to use. And sometimes we need to encourage those people to do that thing which the Lord wants them to do. So this was way up in Birmingham all those years ago. Talking of Birmingham, didn't we do well? <laughs> I can't miss it. I'm sorry, but didn't we do well? I loved it. And of course, I watched the opening ceremony and all that um, incredible information that we got about the role of Brum in the Industrial Revolution. Fantastic. I loved it. You know, and the language. I mean, you know, we never went and walked along the canal. We walked along the cut. We didn't have butterflies or moss. We had bob owlers. I don't know where that came from. But suddenly, I'm back in Birmingham, and I'm seeing it, and I'm remembering it. And I'm thinking, this well done, city, well done, that was great. I tried to watch the closing ceremony, but that was a bit beyond me, because it was about groups, pop groups, that came out of the city of Birmingham. Well, my pop days ended with Simon and Garfunkel, <laughs> the Mamas and the Poppers. Yeah, Peter, Paul, and Mary, a bit of Johnny Cash, some jazz, and then it stopped. I had kids. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're not going to listen to Top of the Pops when you've got kids listening to it full blast. So I didn't watch that bit. But that, of course, led me on to think, what is God's expectations of us now? What are they of me? What are my experiences now? Have I stopped suddenly expecting exciting things of God? Have I stopped thinking with a bigger vision of what the Lord requires me to do? How he wants me to pray? Because I remember, with a great deal of affection, my home city. I truly do. But I remember in the late 50s going to work and that if you're walking through the city of Birmingham and you've got dust on your shirt or on your blouse, on your jacket... You did not brush it off, because if you did, you'd have black, oily streaks everywhere. I remember the smog. Thick, yellow, sulfuric stuff that blinded you, choked you, made you feel quite disgusting, and disorientated you completely. The Industrial Revolution, yes, of course we all enjoy the benefits. Of course it's incredible the things that were accomplished and still going on being accomplished. But we forget. We forget there is stuff to clean up. It's like having a party, isn't it? And everybody's having fun and there's enough food and there's enough drink and everybody's chatting and laughing and it's great. And the party ends and you're left with the detritus, aren't you? Because somebody surely 
trod on a sausage roll into the carpet or spilt wine or whatever. You've got to clear that up. And that's where we're at now, because we're having to clear up the mess that we've already made. We, we made it. We made it. And we have the responsibility of clearing up that mess. I believe that what we need now is to be aware that we were indeed called, as were those first disciples, to continue the ministry of Jesus. That, for me, is what those well-known verses in John 14 is saying. John 14, verse 11. You know them off by heart. We know them so well. Let's not misuse them. It's about continuing the ministry of Jesus to, hi to his disciples there and now to us. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This is about stepping into that ministry that Jesus has given us. And remember, Jesus was there at the creation. He knows how beautiful this world will, should be. He knows how it was created. He knows what we've done. There will be a day of reckoning. And as we watch, as we watch the world go mad, this is the elephant in the room. Okay, there are other elephants too that demand our attention. The state of our nation, the state of different places around the world. But when you see worldwide the impact of all that we have done with the flooding, the fires, those fires, trees burning, trees, the lungs that we depend on so much. I believe that we are all being called to pray and to pray some more with a bigger vision and bigger understanding of what the Lord requires of us. I'm sure there are groups everywhere praying. I'm sure that when each of us meets with our prayer partners or whoever we pray with, that this is something that we must put at the top of our list, to take responsibility for people that are involved in that kind of work that will take us on to do something spectacular, to try and arrest what's going on with the climate and the impact that it's had. I moaned like the clappers about the heat. But at the end of the day, you know, that's what's going to happen. And we need to be aware of it. For me, I am fearful. I confess it. I want my fear and the fear of those around us to be put into trust again, to become trust. I want to get rid of that and to be able to pray more positively. And we need to turn worry into prayer. It's not enough for people like me to just be able to say, well, I'll be out of all this in no time at all. We have generations of people behind us and how we pray now and how we behave and how prepared we are to take responsibility is going to be how they are going to be able to live their lives and be effective. We are part now of that ministry that Jesus set up. Mark spells it out. There will be other gospel writers that will come and they will do, if you like, a, a fulsome job of describing the nativity of Jesus, the genealogy, the theology, but we have Mark's account, invaluable, the first account. It has a reality to it. Let's read it and catch up with Jesus and what he was doing and understand its implications for us. I love the Lord. Don't you? Don't you love the fact that he touched your life in such a powerful way? Haven't you got a story to tell? Isn't he calling you to be the people that pray and pray some more with big vision 
big power. We say that sing louder and louder in a song that we sang last week. Maybe we need to pray louder and louder so other people catch up and start praying too. It's not too late. Let it never be too late. But let's take the challenge because Heavenly Father, we do love you and we are aware of how much you love us and how much of the beauty you created around us. And we love it and we enjoy it. And we love also the initiative of men and women who have created such extraordinary things for us to enjoy life to the full in a very practical way. But Father, now is the time for us to take seriously the impact that all of that has had on your beautiful creation. Help us to be caught up with that sense of responsibility. Lord, teach us how to pray. May we do so in the name and to the glory of Jesus. Amen, Lord. Amen.